uh, at least on the top left of my screen. He is doing the screening on YouTube. He's joining us from Dehradun. Uh, Shintini Chakraborty, our uh, old-time volunteer again, joining us from Kolkata. Uh, Nipun, who was with me with another uh, I um, in Rajasthan, for again the Guru Kulanda scholarship team. And of course, uh, Arna Roy and PM Krishna ji. So now I'll hand over the reins to Nipun and 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 maybe I'll see you again at the end of the stream. So over to you, Nipun. Thank you, Anish and Abhishek uh, for organizing this lovely virtual gathering. Uh, namaste, viewers. I would like uh, to thank you for joining us for this session. And I'll not take much time. I'll quickly introduce Aruna ji. Uh, and then Shinjini can introduce uh, Krishna ji after this. So uh, Aruna Roy is a leading social activist uh, of uh, the country. And she's known for her efforts to fight corruption and promote government transparency. She was the main power behind many social movements, including the RTI movement, and was awarded the prestigious Raymond Maxis Award for her community leadership. Something that a lot of us don't know is that in her formative years, she studied in uh, Kala Kshetra in the, what was called Madras, in, what, in Madras back then. Um, there she spent some time learning classical Indian art, dance, and music. She was also mentioning about it um, in the back session. Uh, according to her, it left a deep impression on her personality. Uh, she is also the co-founder of MKSS, which she founded in 1983, which has been instrumental in taking up everything from human rights and women's rights to Jan Sunwais on social issues and more. In 2004, she set up the School for Democracy, an institution with an ambitious goal to give India's youth a taste of participatory democracy. She's uh, Nani Ji for some, uh, she's I for some, and she's Aruna Roy for some, and all of us love her very much. Thank you. Welcome, Aruna Ji. Thank you, thank you. Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be co hosting this session with, uh, with Aruna Ji and TM Krishna, sir. Uh, I'd like to very briefly. Uh, introduce TM sir but I don't think if I'll do justice to it because just now as we were talking behind the screen uh, to put people like Aruna ma'am or TM sir into labels is not viewing them as a whole, as the holistic people that they are but I'll try to do my bit and do justice to uh, TM sir's introduction. In one of his talks, after he was awarded the Magsaysay Award in 2016, TM Sir was quite simply described as a singer trained under the Carnatic tradition of Indian classical music. Like I said, it would not do justice to call him just that, because his is one of the most vociferous voices talking about socio-political issues, sufferings of the marginalized, and he never flinches to express his views that are often against the current of the waters. His uncommon renditions and very original interpretations of music elude definitions of conventionality. So, uh, so while within staying, the, staying within the framework of tradition, he's trying to bring a new meaning to music through innovations. And his interactions with, uh, as an artist with music are a reflection of his thoughts about the society that we live in and the need for it to change and improve and become much more inclusive and accepting. We welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much. Uh, truly an honor to have a conversation with Karuna ji. Likewise. <laughs> Now we would like uh, Aruna ji to give her opening remarks on today's topic, which is uh, labor, art, and pandemic. Why is it such an important topic in today's time? I think this uh, COVID-19 has really been a huge expose of all the various ills that are there in our society, beginning with governance and ending with the workers' condition, or beginning with the workers' condition and ending with governance, whichever way you like to see it. 
what it has exposed is the absolute and utter callousness of a system towards its poorest. Uh, a few days ago, all know that 16 laborers, women were run over by a goods train in Aurangabad. We know, for instance, that a woman delivered on the highway, walking towards her home. We know that people are restricted from movement. We know that they are being pushed into very cramped accommodation in camps. We know that there are people everywhere who got four hours notice to shift miles and miles away. And who are these migrant labor? These migrant labor are people whom we need more than they need us. Because we need them to run all the various small factories, all the small enterprises, all the small economic instit institutions that deliver for you and me. If there is going to be, and there will be a huge economic crisis, it will be mostly because we've got rid of our largest economic force. 92% of India's workforce is in the unorganized sector. And these unorganized sector workers, even though there is an MGNREGA which gives them the right to work in a village, it only offers a hundred days work to a family, which means the family of five adults, you have many people work, capable of working. So there's always a situation where some stay home and some go out. But the situation of the migrant workers has only opened our eyes to the tremendous biases that are building up in our country through democratically elected governments in which we repose our faith and our trust that they will run it according to the constitution, that they will care for all of us equally. The treatment meted out to these people, millions of them in this country, has horrified many of us. They are hungry. They are without access to health, they are far away from homes, and they are not getting even the smallest of compensation. This is getting into a train or a bus to reach home. And, you know, I don't know how many of you read and how many of you are interested in this issue, but if you really look up the papers and look up information, there's plenty to see. Just off the bat, there was one uh, about two, three weeks ago, the Delhi government tried to organize buses for people to leave the city. And the government of India, Ministry of Home Affairs, came down very heavily on the civil servant who was organizing the buses, suspended him. So you have threats <clears throat> of, of uh, people being quarantined or being isolated. And the situation is really going from bad to worse. We are saying, as a measure of support, even to the poor who are in the villages, who are now workless, because there's no way they can go out to work. Unless they go out to work, there's nothing. So we've been demanding that many, many institutions that exist for them, like the NGNREGA has a provision that if you ask for work and work is not provided to you, then the government has to pay you a non-unemployment allowance. It's under the law. It's a right. So we've been arguing with government that since they have not been able to come to you to even ask for the work, you put them into these little boxes or little shacks, which are their homes, you must pay them the unemployment allowance, not only the unemployment allowance, but in this case, you must pay them full wages for two months. We've been arguing that you have 77 million tons of food grain in the FCI go-downs. You must distribute them. You must increase your rations. You must distribute the grains. We've also been saying that in so far as health is concerned, open up, occupy all public health. Public health should be the main thing. You occupy all private health health institutions, you take them over. Because what we need now, we are dying of COVID. Maybe the numbers who are dying of COVID are far less than those who are dying of dying of other illnesses. And amongst them, there is one new disease, which is called the communal virus. So there is one virus, which is a disease which is spread with, with, with health hazards. There's another virus which is taking over our psyche. So the communal virus is such today that some people really believe that it's a virus that only attacks a single community. So much so that in very many places, for instance in Barmer, before someone buys your vegetables, they ask you which caste you are or what is your name. And they ask you, 
caste in Rajasthan also includes religion. So they're asking you your name before they buy your vegetables because they believe that if you're a Muslim and that if you sell vegetables, then you'll contaminate them. I mean, it's the kinds of misuse of this COVID-19 and the imposition of isolation is enormous. So one, you're building up all kinds of fear and phobia, one being Islamophobia, but there is also all kinds of other phobias that are being developed. We are unable to protest because we are, they have no access to media. There are no printed newspapers, as you all know. They're all relying on electronic newspapers and electronic newspapers are only accessed by very few of us. The poor have no access. The musical community in Rajasthan, which I'll just touch upon because Krishna is going to talk at length about it. Uh, but the musical community in Rajasthan, they're performers. They perform every day for food. They go and sing somewhere or they go and sing in hotels or they sing here and there and that's how they earn. They are a performing community. So whether you talk from the the Doli, who just is a drum beater to the Manganiyas and Langas, who are major performers, but not all of them are rich. Even the Manganiyas and Langas have stratified system. Many of them make money. Many don't make. Most, most don't make money. So when you deny them basic rations and food, and you don't do your tabulation and corrections quickly enough, there are starv there's starvation and there's, end there's endemic starvation now. They're not really hungry. Totally, you don't die, but you never, never have a belly full. So I think to enter into this kind of system of governance without adequate planning is, I think, quite fatal. So I think in that sense, India has gone into a syndrome that you are being used uh, as a kind of a guinea pig because you are now helpless. Well, in a laboratory, you're ensconced in the, in the, under the microscope. But here, we are all ensconced inside our homes. And for the first time in the history of the world, we've all come into our homes like turtles, you know, pulled our noses and our feet in so that we are not hurt by some notion of a virus that's going to spread all over and kill us. And I don't know how far the reality of this, the viciousness of this virus is, but I certainly know that many other viruses have already spread. We are now not good, probably. We'll have to look at whether we'll be able to work in a community. We'll have to be also thinking of how this democratic system is now going to work. We'll also have to think of the kinds of, apart from all the phobias that they have spread, the economic crisis is going to be extraordinary. And I don't know if all these people are migrants will ever want to migrate anywhere to go anywhere because of the hazards of migration and the way we have all treated them in the last two months. So I think the issues are enormous. And I think musicians are like everybody else. They are people. And there are, they have to be treated as performers who, like the NREG worker, earns his or her daily wage. And how are we going to compensate for them? Rajasthan is trying to do something, drawing up lists and trying to reach out to them. But it's all through a system which, uh, which is in any case so stratified and so skewed. Uh, we have been trying with electronic, uh, with the reliance on elect electronics, but I have a fear of that because I feel even this system that we are using now, Zoom, any kind of technology that has taken over our world today is going to make us comfort loving to such an extent that I don't think we're going to move out of our spheres and our homes, maybe even not away from our tables. So we're all going to try and communicate like this, which is not real for me. I like to see faces. I like to see gestures. I like to catch the mood of the moment. None of that is possible with this. But so far as the poor are concerned, the same technology that's going to guarantee that they get the food, the guarantees that get their health and guarantees everything is going to turn completely into a surveillance mechanism. It's going to turn into, like Arogya Setu, it's going to be compulsory. It's going to be entered into all your phones, into every system. And you are going to be completely at the mercy of a system which need not necessarily, as we now know, be fair, need not necessarily be just as we know. It need not necessarily follow the constitutional norms. It doesn't have even the basic decency and the uh, <coughs> honor to give us what the vote guaranteed, which is a hearing. So we are really now, I think, that way, in a very, very critical stage. And it's now all over the world, there's a fear 
There are many people coming together all over the world, across countries, because the system has now gone into seeped into everything. I end with one uh, one statement. I was reading an article in the New York Times about three or four months ago, maybe six months ago, in which somebody wrote that we have become a generation which likes convenience and comfort. We'll give up anything for convenience and comfort, and I think. This business of technology really leads me into that statement that if we are going to be so happy with, with you know, with ATM cards and with swipes and sweeps and whatever else, then uh, we'll be victims of this iPads and uh, uh, tablets and of the electronic uh, equipment, equipment. And I would really, really, however wonderful Krishna is on the screen, and I do listen to a lot of his and other people's music on the YouTube, but certainly listening to him in a concert is so much different. And I wouldn't ever say that there's a compensation of listening to him on the YouTube. I would really love to hear him in person. So I think none of these things uh, we consciously think of, but it's seeping into our subconscious. I'll end there and then I'll wait for questions. I thank you all very much for inviting me and I'm really looking forward to what Krishna has to say. Thank you so much, Aruna, ma'am. Uh, uh, so, TM, sir, before I invite your opening comments, I'd like to uh, ask you something right off before we start with your comment. Uh, in one of um, the memorials of Girish Karnad, you spoke about how Giri, uh, the movement of artists and uh, the concept of movement is very important for artists. So uh, when I'd also like you to address the issue of how the movement of artists is different from the movement of lab laborers for that matter and how the trauma is totally different for an artist. Well, um, I'm not sure the trauma is very different. Um, so I'd like to just actually, uh, I will answer your question, but I would like to pick two words which uh, Aruna used. One is uh, um, unorganized. And uh, she expressed something which is about the invisibilization of people. And I think those two are the words that I'm going to pick when I speak about artists. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the world of art in the privileged mediums of discussion, uh, of performance, of, uh, of the media, always discusses art as something that is either glamorous, either financially very stable or exotic. All these three frameworks of discussing art are deeply disturbing in my opinion. Um, and in the exotic category, uh, where we add all these mysticisms to it, etc., lies all these art forms beyond the realm of the so-called classical. And because of these categorizations, there's one thing that is never discussed is the economy and the socio-economics of art and artists. It is never discussed as a point of discussion. Um, therefore, most of art, first of all, lives in the margins and artists are on the margins. These are artists we use. I mean, the most ugly part of it is we use these artists like almost puppets to prove our Catholicity and our diversity. And the moment we have proved it to ourselves and to, our, to the world, they are back where they are, which is without food on the plate and struggling for the next meal. And this is the reality that I think it has hit even me, let me be very honest. It has hit me harder. I mean, one is philosophizing this and understanding it, but to be hit by this reality in the last four months is very different. You know, from if you take the south of India, uh, from uh, about the end of Feb, March, April, May, is when a lot of the temple festivals and socio-religious events take place. Most art forms in this belt have the performances at that time. Most of these artists are performing between March and May. They make some money, which kind of they can, helps them bridge the next four, five months. And many of them are doing daily wage work, either agriculture, for the next few months to bridge the next part of the uh, year. This is an everyday, every year reality for generations. We're not talking about one person. For generations, this is almost a reality. This is how life is. 
So let us, there's no question of saving. There is no question of, uh, you know, comfort. It's a question of, it is a, a poverty-stricken situation, a perpetual poverty-stricken situation. Now, the other day we were talking to Arunajin, we, you know, if you think of it, the whole idea of movement, today's scenario is, is really, really um, odd. You have all the migrant workers staying stuck in different parts of the country, unable to go back home or doing the very difficult thing of walking home and, and risking their lives. And we know what has happened. And then you have all these artists who need to move out of their home during the season to perform in the temples, who are stuck in their house, in their villages, in the nook and corners. So ultimately, the whole idea of economy and movement, art and movement are extremely interconnected. The essence of art, any art, is actually movement. And the essence of the economy of art is also movement. It's identical for the world of, of uh, development or economic development or democracy. It is the movement of people and their own physical movements that gives us what we call development. Both these people have been immobilized today and they, the, 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 the really saddening aspect of it is they were always invisible. We never treated them as people, as artists. You know, we have to say we never treated them as people and artists in the case of artists. And we never treated, uh, you know, people of, you know, uh, who do uh, uh, labor as people, individuals with aspirations and most important people with a mind. The greatest, the most dangerous individualization is when you dissociate the idea of the mind from the from the labor. Labor is not considered something of the mind. The moment you take that out, you consider the human being to be a tool, a machine, a person of repetitive act. So it doesn't matter if his name is Krishna, Aruna, or something else, right? It really doesn't matter. His name doesn't matter because he doesn't have a mind. If you had a mind, then you would say this was Krishna's opinion. This was Aruna's opinion. This is the way Krishna did something. But you remove the mind and it could be anybody. Who cares? That's what we have done with the idea of labor itself. It's a deep-seated problem. It's a, so when we talk about discrimination hierarchies, let us not forget that a lot of the discrimination be begins in the way we intellectualize things and the way we feel about things. Whether it is color, whether it is work, whether it is uh, uh, art, it's the same thing. So, you know, the whole idea of invisibilization is at the essence of both problems. They are not very different. And if you speak, to, I mean, I've been speaking to many artists in many villages, and um, the similarities are so striking. And she's, and Aruna said something about, you know, I want to talk about starvation here. You know, we talk about starvation only if somebody is dying. So starvation is recognized if somebody died. But you and I, if we didn't get a full meal for more than a day, then we, we say we are starving. We all say it. But the marginalized artist or the marginalized worker, we calculate based on what? On the fact, is, let, on the fact that he will not die tomorrow. So let him have enough so that he can live, so that he can continue to do what that little thing he is doing. I mean, how cruel can this be? I mean, how cruel can it be? We do this in the art world too. You know, when we when we say we're going to support artists, you know, I say it too. I mean, sometimes I wonder, you know, financial constraints kept aside just for a moment. How am I deciding how much money should go for a family? I mean, just think how I, how I calculate that. And if you think how we calculate that, we say, you know, so when you calculate these ideas of basic minimum, these notions of what is basically needed for a month, I think we need to seriously think, of course, keeping uh, accessibility and, and resource in place. How does our mind work with that? Will we use the same metric if we were talking about ourselves? I'm just thinking about it. And most of the time you find we will not use that metric if you were talking about ourselves. So I know we have to say that we have most of the world of art in India today starving. All those people that, you know, what really, really upsets me is that we use, we use them so often to, to show them off. 
but there is no system in place. You know, at least thanks to work by Aruna and Nikhil and everybody else, the uh, worker today can assure herself or himself of 100 days of work at a certain minimum wage. There is no such framework for the artist community. Okay? There is no such framework that assures the artist to say, you know, we will make sure that you have work for 100 days. There's no system because they don't, their, their work doesn't fall in the category of labor. Their uh, work doesn't fall in the category of being elite enough for people like me to say, yes, I'll pay a lot. So they actually have no access to an economic model. We have not created an economic framework for them anywhere in this country, anywhere, any state. So what is happening is it's basically ad hoc. It is if they feel that they need to be supported, they will be. The other problem is you look at numbers. I mean, of course, the world of artists within every state is not, the numbers are not going to be so huge. Therefore, it is easy to ignore. We must recognize there are many, you know, another thing, we always talk about art also when art is dying. Then we want to build a museum. Let me say this out loud. The moment we say we want to build a museum for something, it means we failed. The moment something is in a museum, it means our society lost something. Okay. So therefore, building museums, while I, I understand the other uh, philosophical reasons for it, let us take museums as to be as a recognition that we have actually lost something. So again, art is talked about, those art forms are talking about, oh, there's nobody performing it. Why will there be anybody performing it? If the state will not think that it's important enough to be, uh, to, to be held together and the community to be built. There is a problem in this country that art is not taken to be a necessity of life. We do not consider, you know, we keep using words like, you know, culture and art. We actually mean nothing by it. We are, we are, we are a bunch of liars for I don't know how many years. Because we really don't know. If we did, we will realize that art and culture is as important as anything else. You can't change, for example, practices of public health, you know, practices of, say, of sanitation, etc. if you don't dis address the cultural being of the place we're discussing. You can't change that. So unless you are able to recognize that culture, habit, art, expression is a necessary condition for, the hu for human existence, you will never change the way you look at artists. You know, you must ask the question, why do the poorest of poor draw on their hearts? Don't they have anything else to do? I mean, seriously, they don't have money. Why do they paint on their hearts? Why do they put designs in front of their homes? I mean, it's not just some whimsical thing. There is a very symbiotic connection between form and color and expression and identity and such varied ideas of beauty that actually gives stability, emotional and psychological stability and reasoning for the person to exist. So as much as 150 rupees gives reason for that person to exist, this, fe this feeling, momentary feeling, also is a reason to believe and to hope. If you don't think that is essential for human existence, then I think we've completely lost the plot on why we all live and why we all make communities, why we all, why we discuss words like empathy or discuss ideas like sharing, because all this comes from expression and culture and coexistence. And as much as culture and art can be manipulated for the most evil things, and we have also seen that happening today. I mean, I could, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I was totally surprised when apparently an ad was put out by some Jain establishment that, saying that Jane food, no Muslim employed here. This happened just two days ago and the police had to arrest this guy. I mean, that's other reality. I want to say this here. The fact that we have not recognized the essentiality of art and culture is the reason why that is the greatest tool being used today to, to separate us and to create, to create hatred, violence, and divisiveness. Because if we had been far more... What and far more, I mean, not just recognize if he had if it participated with greater vigor about these ideas, then it would not have been as easy as we see it happening today. 
you know, whether it is a religious divide, whether it is conversations beyond caste or, or across caste, gender conversations, in all this, the catalyst is a cultural conversation. And I think that is something that we did not do enough. And I think uh, our pandemic situation is also highlighting that. The invisibilization of people also happens when we don't have cultural conversations. When we don't know the songs of the migrant workers in different states. You know, in Tamil Nadu, for example, we've been working with, with about 20,000 migrant workers. Most of them are from Jharkhand. Uh, the highest population of the migrant workers we work from the tw from 20,000 is Jharkhand and next is West Bengal. I mean, this, I mean, the songs of movement, for example. I mean, this. What culture are we talking about when we do? I don't know the song of the Jharkhandi um, worker. I've never thought about it till this moment. I mean, we don't even know. So, I mean, we have to expand our horizons in terms of how we see people, in terms of how we see cultures. And I think the word, the way we use the word labor, needs rediscovery, and needs some some amount of introspection in all of us. You know, the word labor. You know, for example, even in art, there are certain art forms, elite art forms, that we will never call labor. You will never call what an IAS officer is doing labor. Similarly, you will never call me, a Carnatic musician, my performance, act of labor. You will never. You will say mystical, spiritual, all these great, you know, these lovely words that, you know, make me feel like I'm levitating five, five feet above uh, ground or some nonsense. And the Babu thinks that he's the most intellectual person who's going to solve the whole world's problems, right? I mean, all these are something that we're enjoying on these on all of us. But you will never use that. You, but when you say labor, you automatically are, you never use that word for us. You use the word for certain, certain art forms. I can tell you, they themselves call it labor. They call it labor. They don't call it some elevating art form. They call it labor. So what categorizes the people into these frameworks? What, what pushes them into this? And what uh, sometimes their, their act is also an act of caste obligation. They have to perform, by the way, some art forms, certain caste groups have to perform to fulfill an obligation to a slightly higher position caste. And if they don't, they can be beaten. People also died. So let's look look at this complexity of these words and complexity of how these things play out um, in our scenario i think i'll stop there oh, so uh, so before i pass on to nipun there are two points that i'd like to make here uh, you spoke about the term labor so in west bengal the government doesn't use the term migrant labor. They've started using the term guest workers, which is a much more humane term. They, call, they got it from they got it from Kerala. Kerala, <laughs> Kerala, Kerala started it. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, and uh, one more very important thing that you brought out that uh, most of the artists are marginalized, and then again. We talk about all these great heritage structures, Taj Mahal and Shah Jahan, and uh, uh, the beauty of Taj Mahal. And while Shah Jahan was the one who just commissioned it, he sure has a great role in it. He commissioned it. But what about all those people who worked on it, actually, who put in their toil in it and made it so beautiful? We just forget them. Yeah, but you but you know the name Tan, Tan Sen, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we should know why we remember Tan Sen, but we don't know the persons who built the Taj, and we know why. This also, uh, this also reminds me of uh, Rodolphe's essay called In Praise of Idleness, and where he mentions about how we never associate, you know, luxury or leisure with labor. We always mm -hmm. think that they have to work all day, and only the people who are privileged can uh, have leisure time. You know uh, that... There's a very beautiful couple of lines from William Butler Yeats, mm -hmm. which has always moved me. He says, he that sings the lasting song thinks in a marrow bone. Mm. He, <laughs> the lasting song, thinks in a marrow bone. It to yeah. some extent defines Krishna. You know, because unless you know what it is that happens in your body, not just a physical body, but in the body politic, how are you going to sing with the soul? Yeah. Where does your where does your aesthetic come from? So I love those lines from William Butler Yeats. 
he that sings the last thing song thinks in a marrow bone. So you have yeah. to understand that these divides are really artificial. So, you know, even that word leisure you use, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because we always associate intellectual activity. I and mean, in fact, one of the arguments, philosophical arguments made is that as you move, uh, as you move away from physical activity and it's, it's used and evolutionary idea is used in it. So, for example, mm -hmm. when you use most of your time collecting food, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, the evolutionary idea is that as the human being, as the species, Homo sapiens, as we use less less of our time for fundamental activities like collecting food, etc., you have then uh, the frontal lobe developing and, and in, you know intellectual. So this is used as an as uh, an explanation to the idea of leisure that you need only when you have leisure and you're spending less time on physical activity does intellectual activity. This is nonsense because leisure is not about doing nothing. No, no, not at all. No way, yeah. <laughs> Puril yes. community so long. That I know that, and Komal Kothari, one of the biggest names in folk history, in recording the history of folk music and folk history in Rajasthan, he used to say that your culture comes from agriculture. Yeah. It depends on how you grow, it depends on how your seasons are. Yeah. And all the songs that I've heard sung everywhere in rural Rajasthan comes from their occupation. Absolutely. Their for harvesting, they have songs for reaping, they have songs for, and such beautiful songs. And you know, it's it's just that it's all linked so intimately with what one does. Yeah, absolutely. And, and leisure also by itself is not a, a, a state of physical inaction. In fact, leisure is the possibility of space in the mind, and that can happen. You know, when you're doing anything, yeah. as long as you're you're part of that, like like Aruna said. As long as it is connected to that being and connected to that soil, connected to that to the air, then it automatically comes. And so, therefore, you know, we have to be very careful because these are these uh, pretty, you know, uh, well used intellectual arguments yeah. about art and leisure and labor and uh, you know, uh, Maslowian pyramid, which has self actualization in the top. Yeah, yeah. it's a failure. <laughs> On, on similar lines, Arunaji, I would like to also backtrack a bit and ask you if you can tell us a bit about, you know, the role of art in social movements that you have been part of. I remember Shankar Mama's, you know, puppet performances or even the symbol of MKSS, which has the fist, which also got uh, translated into the book or yeah. the idea behind the design of School for Democracy. Maybe if you can elaborate a bit. Yeah, sure I will. Because, you see, let me go back to a story uh, that links me with Krishna. Once, about 15 years ago, Krishna was performing in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And not only was Krishna performing, but Leela Samson was dancing and uh, Bombay Jayashri was also singing. And I made a trip all the way from Rajasthan just to attend that performance. For me, mm -hmm. it's like a um, person who thirsts for something. Suddenly, it becomes impossible not to hear or listen to a certain kind of culture. I live culturally all the time, mind you. But after all, I am also conditioned by my uh, where I was born and what I was taught and what I like. And sometimes I feel it's something I have to assert my individuality about. So I traveled all the way there. And unfortunately, I was as I was, at dusty and whatever. And I happened to have a friend who made quite sure that I sat in front and where all the so-called dignitaries were also there. And one election commissioner who happened to be there at the time saw me and said, Aruna Roy, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. I felt like telling him when I'm not sitting on the street and shouting slogans, I, I also listen to classical music. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these are not contradictory things. So anyway, let me go back to one very important thing I want to share with you. And then I'll go back to the NKSS history. You know, when depression hit the United States of America, how did Roosevelt solve it? Uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt solved it. He had something called the New Deal. And they had massive economic programs. The government spent enormous amounts of money giving work to people. Mm. I went to the University of Illinois once to talk. And the whole university was painted by painters who are out of jobs wow. because of the New Deal. Mm. It can be very wonderful creative. We've been fighting with the government of Rajasthan that our manganiyas and langas should be given 100 days employment to teach music in local schools. 
Why can't their employment not be digging something which is what, 10 feet by 10 feet by 1 foot, which is what a Narega worker does, but give him or her the opportunity to be a music teacher? Because that's also one aspect of labor. Anyway, for me and for movements, you know, that's why once I think Krishna and I were together in another meeting in which we talked about movements. I, we are called people from the movements, but music is also full of movements. So we thought we took up that metaphor and spoke. Uh, Krishna remembers about two years ago. So movements are no movements without music. What binds us together is song. What binds us together gives us energy, is slogan, singing, and theater. If we didn't have it and we didn't have posters, where is the movement? It's both symbols. And if Monji, Monba, as we called him, had not made those wonderful songs which went all over Rajasthan and Shankar hadn't made those beautiful lyrics with many others and neither I, I didn't lead any campaign or movement. It was led by multiple people. I was one voice. Similarly, songs, Shankar was a catalyst, an old-fashioned word. But actually, many people got together to create those songs. Sushila and Norki created women's songs. They were all wonderful songs. And the song... And this is where I think COVID is going to destroy our capacity to sing, not physically sing, but sing. Because song comes from a composite human being. If that human being is divided and scattered and fragmented, which is what this whole COVID-19 is going to do to us, there will be no song. And what comes through from movements is that song. Because it's politics, because it comes from hunger, comes from the need for compassion. It comes from the need to communicate. It is, comes from the need to be one, despite all the differences. And that is the strength. And we have always found that when you sing, as we've sung in, in KSS, as you've been there, and as uh, uh, Anish has also been with us, you know that we don't sing anywhere near what Krishna's singing is. It's all upper swaram, as we say in uh, Carnatic music, besura, as you say in Northern India. <laughs> shouting most of the time, it's anything. But this unison of those voices produces an energy which is unbelievable. And I, that's why I said I'm worried that COVID will prevent the unison of voices, that COVID will make us isolated and fragmented voices. What the women's movement has been fighting against is that we don't want to be fragmented. We, we want to be seen as one being. Now that is it, is it really, is it a state or that we will lose it? Certainly, the School for Democracy looks at uh, how theory and practice are actually the same. How action and reflection are one. Because it's in your categorization that you see action and reflection. But it's the same thing. When I, if I can't, if I can't, I can't act without reflection. And what will I reflect on if there's no action? So these are all intertwined concepts and intertwined um, Actually, living is intertwined. You can't really, it's only when you sit down and want to formulate a theory or you want to sell an idea that you talk like that. And I personally have learned from the best brains which are not born out of universities, but born out of experience and wisdom. And there are so many wonderful things like Sushila's great story about understanding about the importance of information when she said hamara pesa hamara hisab or of the concept of chunni singh when he realized how wonderful how important it was chunni singh went with me by the way to manila when i when we went to the maxis there was a toss up as to who would go and it was chunni singh who went with me and he's never went to school but you should have seen how he deported himself over there nobody could have and when we went to adb and we were invited to adb and uh, I told you, you got to answer all the questions. I'll have to speak, but you will answer all the questions. And when they asked something about transparency, he said in Hindi, Aap kya, aap ke to yahan ek kya karta hai, dusri ko malum hai kya? Is daftar mein. He said, Amare baare mein aap pooch rahe ho. Mainne suna hai ki aap Rajasthan Sarkar ko paise bhej rahe hai. Bhejne ke pehle, hume bataiye ki aap kitna paisa bhej rahe hai. बाकी उनका करप्शन है कि नहीं हम देखेंगे आप कौन होते हो देखने वाले तो दे टोल्ड हिम अरे यार वी ऑल थॉट यू वर द एयर इंडिया महाराजा बिकॉज यू नो वेरी मच साफा आई एम टोकी एंड तू तो सोचने वाला आदमी है ही सेड अरे दोस्त यू वुडंट 
without me and Aruna inside if she hadn't won the match to say and I hadn't come with her. So yeah. don't. I'm to sab samaste hai. So in a sense, the wisdom of people is extraordinary. So I would really conclude by saying that, in a sense, starvation, as Krishna said. Endemic starvation is not starvation. You have got to die with no food in your stomach. I remember once when we began working with the NKSS and we went to a work site, the huge argument we had with an SDM who said, no, she died of a heart attack or a heart failure. She didn't die of starvation. How else will you die? <laughs> you have to die somehow. So these are, you know, they play on these uh, extraordinary misinterpretation of concepts. But endemic hunger is hunger, and as Krishna very rightly put it, we always say we, are, we all say we are starving. So in today's India, we need to think of a new deal. We th need to think of an urban employment guarantee act. We need to think of an urban rural employment guarantee act extended much beyond its hundred days and made much more plural to cover artists, to cover painters, to cover musicians, to cover theatre people, to cover everybody. And it's going to be a new kind of new deal that we should demand now through MGNREG because we already have a very well worked out theoretical framework and into which we should fit all ourselves in. And I think students, you're also going to be soon out of work because there are not going to be very many jobs for you guys. So you'll also have to think of how else you're going to earn your money now. No longer packages and packets. Nothing is going to arrive on your doorstep. You're going to wonder now how to eke out your living. So I'll end there and say that uh, it's it's a huge, huge challenge. And culture will make it, uh, culture somehow we have to cling on to. Yeah. Uh, music we have to cling on to, to bring us back to that energy. Give us that energy to carry on. Now, I want to add something to uh, something I've been trying to repeatedly, repeatedly say now because, you know, she spoke about, you know, in, in the first section, Aruna spoke about technology and about uh, us becoming technology dependent. You know, I've been asked this question by innumerable number of journalists over the last, I don't know, month. So what do you think the digital space is going to take over uh, art? I mean, the concert's going to happen online. And, you know, we should realize what a privileged question that is. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous that this question is being asked. So only a person like me who has first access, has enough ability, presence online, a market which is, say, trans-global, uh, at least everywhere, uh, who can really even talk in these terms, right? You know, put out a concert and I can raise money. I can, I can do it. And if you're a superstar in Bollywood, you can probably do it like that. So we're only talking about this teeny weeny section of the population who have this access to make digital space a replacement for performance. Most art form is, art forms are geographically limited, community limited, and it is those 100, 200 people in those villages around that area who are watching it. That's how art exists. In fact, that's why, that's how we get diversity. We won't get diversity if all of us are on digital space, by the way. Diversity happens because there's so many pockets around the place and there's cultures around the place. Now, what happens to them? Nobody is discussing that. If they didn't have that performance at that festival or at that event in those villages over that period of two months, everything is gone. They can't ask all the villagers to be watching on their cell phone. I mean, I mean, what are we thinking when we ask these questions? What is our notion of people when we ask these questions? So, I mean, ask this question, this question again and again. And I, I think at one point, I actually lost, they lost my pool with the journalist and shouted. Because I said, do you realize what you're asking me? I mean, uh, you're asking me a question that is that is so discriminative that completely, you know, forgets that most art is limited to special to special kind of environments. And like Arunaji said, it's the food that they eat, it is the smell in the air, it is the seasonal changes, you know. And the, and uh, so we have to actually rethink about how how are we after the pandemic, how is that going to come back? And I'm really worried that. We're going to believe that none of that is important. That's not even important. We don't have to talk about it. No gatherings. I mean, we probably go that direction. So now everybody can do everything online because everything is an app now. If you have an app, you can do anything in life. <laughs> so create another app. 
which means more people know what you're doing. I mean, and we're talking about you know. Uh, I remember Shankar ji once once had this uh, song on the different cards, like the Aadhaar card, number of cards that people are collecting. We now we need a song on the number of apps that people are having, <laughs> yes. because every second month you're having another app that's supposed to solve all your problems. Register your name, give your Aadhaar number, tell them with your uh, you know whether your stomach is okay that day, went to the bathroom right that day, whether you ate well that day, and then that's it. That's also monitored. I mean, since <laughs> work. On- Sorry, whether your fingerprints work or not doesn't matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. So I, I mean, we have to uh, you know open our minds to these realities when we are having these discussions. Uh, so I would like you to respond to what Aruna Ma'am just spoke about a while ago, where she said that uh, activism, art, and music are uh, not contradictory things. They cannot. Uh, sort of exist in separate boxes. They have to go hand in hand. Uh, you know, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what is the function of art? Why did this species create this idea of art? I mean, I think this, that is what, that's the question we should start asking. Uh, why, why so many different kinds of, of uh, forms of movements, even within specific societies? Why? Because I think they recognized, we recognized that the shifts in us can happen only when we feel something deeply. And we recognize it's a sensory happening. And that's when movement and form and everything was abstracted. I mean, even in the cave drawings, I mean, it, okay, they, they mark, say, where the hunter was going to find deer. I mean, find deer for, for, uh, for lunch. But the marking was not just about the deer. It's about the place. It is about his idea of the deer. So in that, there is an emotional recognition and a marker being placed by the painter right there in the cave cave painting. So I think we always knew that art is a way by which people can change and people can respond. And therefore, if the fundamental reason art exists is to look at ourselves, to question ourselves, to look what is around, respond to it with honesty, then it is activism. What else is it? It is nothing but activism. What is activism? Activism is actually responding, not being passive and responding to all that we feel and that we sense and that we learn and that we experience and that we observe with empathy and sensitivity. What is art? Exactly that, isn't it? I don't see what uh, what else art is. When you go to a great concert and you say you come back fulfilled and you think, you actually experience great activism. They didn't call it that. That's all. Because it changed you momentarily. It made you ask questions. It's just, just for that, for those two hours, you really felt that it is possible for you to be slightly better as a human being. So art exists to do exactly the same thing. Which is why art is so important for democracy. Which is why art is integral to activistic acts in terms of slogan or in terms of of theater or whatever. It is essential because, I mean, that's what we're doing. You know, I won't tell you, those people who believe that there is no politics in art are liars. Simply put, they're lying. Because when they, whatever they do is political. You take any concert, play it for me now and tell you what messages are being sent to you. They may believe in the messaging. That's a different thing altogether. So ultimately what they are saying is status quo is comfortable for me. I believe in the status quo messaging. I'll pass on that message to you and let's all feel happy. Now that is also a form of status quo activism, by the way. You and I may disagree with it, but that's what they're doing. So so art is an, an activistic act. I think the moment we recognize within ourselves the possibility of of that transformation, then I think we become more robust in the way we we bring the two together in our own discourse. That's the only thing I can speak for myself in my own experience, is that the recognition that art can do these magical things, at least did to to me, was the point when I saw a greater cohesiveness, conscious cohesiveness in asking questions in the word and asking questions with the song. And that's why they come together for me. Uh, so, 
you pointed out sir that democracy and art in their idealism are very close to each other uh, aruna ma'am would you like to comment on that democracy and art and idealism i think democracy is really all idealism because you're thinking of equality which is always something we are working towards which is never ever there fully you're always working towards equality you're always working towards liberty you're always working towards the fraternity what our constitutional values are and democracy is a system which enables participation and in that enabling that participation it's always making pushing you towards that ideal and denying participation is what covid-19 has done to us therefore it's denying us democracy it's denying us the constitution and in the new labor laws that have been passed by ordinance in up they are denying us blatantly denying us our constitutional rights they are denying us our fundamental rights they are denying us basic human rights mm. workers rights but human rights to exist if you say that there are going to be no hours of work and you can make a worker work for any hour, any number of hours what was the point of history what was the point of the french revolution which fought for bread what was the point of 1864 when we got the right to an 8 hour working day what has been a series of struggles all over the world to get decency and dignity to human life the kind of equality at least in terms of hours we work we are not we are not struggling for earning that 50000 rupees a day that some very rich man is earning we are asking for whatever our minimum wages you got you are stuck at the minimum wage for everything that is wrong with society the person right at the bottom the most vulnerable is responsible and squashed first but democracy has given that person a voice democracy has given that person a vote and so this is an ideal but today the new system by bringing in these kinds of very very arbitrary centralized completely dictatorial diktats is finishing off that voice and therefore i will always struggle for democracy and i cannot blame democracy as many of the middle class does uh, i have heard lots of arguments we should bring in dictatorship fascism <laughs> so much uh, you know it makes things work this democracy is useless it brings in chaos friend you will also be a victim of that kind of new diktat very soon today you are okay because you are seeing the vulnerable being squashed the other being squashed but in the other you exist so tomorrow when you are being squashed you will understand what it means not to have the freedom and that essential freedom and liberty which democracy talks about is the idealism so in that poor person's voice in that woman who delivered on the road i have delivered the woman and the child on the road with that woman i must feel that in my body and in my blood when those 16 women died on that railway track they were my brothers or sisters you know if you don't have that kind of empathy and don't have that kind of humanity what is religion what is religion about i'd like to ask you religion is not going and breaking a coconut in a temple or going and tying a thread in a in a in a darga it's what you feel for others is your religion what you feel for humanity is your religion and somewhere democracy has given space in a very very clear legal framework for expressing that sympathy and empathy and also within within a structure struggling for it without violence for me so for me democracy is an idea it's a working system it's a process it's a set of principles it's a set of values and it's my life uh uh krishna ji i just got a very interesting question uh from shirja who is also a singer and an architect she asks uh how can other musicians in the carnatic circuit and outside of it join on your vision of equality through music musicians may not be privileged enough to take some stances that you take like not performing in december but may still want to express their solid solidarity in other ways well i mean um first uh, i think that it's there's no one way of doing any of these things so it's it's not like uh, 
you know, they have to join me in that sense. I think if there, first of all, can be multiple clusters of artists having these conversations, these genuine conversations about their own being and their, their own function of why they are doing all this. And I think it's also important for, for, I really believe it's very important, especially for the privileged world to make themselves uncomfortable. Uh, it's. I, I think that put yourself in positions that you're not comfortable with, with experiences that you're not comfortable with. I think it's a great starting point for realizations. And uh, therefore, what I will encourage all these artists who, uh, who, are, who are asking this question is actually experience culture. Try and see if somewhere you can debaggage yourself with the kind of judgments that we make. Because essential to a lot of their, lot what we're discussing is how we judge things that we see and things that we receive, things that we perceive. The moment we've already judged it based on our baggage, we've already placed it in a place of hierarchy. And actually, we've, actually our judgment itself many times is an act which is very undemocratic because it doesn't have empathy. It does not have the feeling of a connection. And it is all coming from a position of some amount of intellectual, emotional, aesthetic power that we believe we already have. So I think the first thing that artists need to do is try and have different experiences of life and culture. And that itself, I think, can lead to a lot of interesting discoveries and ways of doing things. And I agree, everybody may not, let's be very clear, even, even in asking questions, you need, you need to be in a position of power so that you know that tomorrow you will not be knocked off the rails uh, in what you're doing. Um, I mean, I, by, by the time I started asking this question, I was in a comfortable position in my profession uh, to take on the establishment, to challenge the establishment. I know there are many people who may not be in that position. So I'm just saying, and it's not necessary that you have to do everything publicly. <laughs> There are a lot of things that can happen in small circles, in small groups, in small discussions, with schools, with children. I th that's where I think we all need to go. I would encourage artists who really feel deeply about these things, form little groups and go to schools. Please go to schools. Sing and speak for children, with children. Because I think it is, that's where, that's, I, I'm really worried that we're losing, we are losing a generation of two to the thought of, uh, to the normalization of violent thinking that we cannot allow to happen. And I think that's where young artists who don't want to confront the established powers can play a role. You can find your own way to express that. You can find your own, uh, uh, use your cleverness to position it the way you want to position it. But I think it's possible and I think it's important and I think it's also important for institutions of culture and art across this country to go through some self-introspection because we all, most of these institutions have also been very marginalizing in their own, own setup, in their perception of art, in their perception, the words that we use with regard to art. You know, I think there also needs to be some amount of conscious reflection and change. And I think in all this, younger artists can really play a role, uh, a, a really large role uh, to change things. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a question for both of you, sir and ma'am. Uh, so in one of Samuel Beckett's plays, Waiting for Godot, we see this character of Lucky who talks about divine uh, apathy towards the uh, the things that he has to go through. And he, a lot of people consider Lucky, the character of Lucky to be a, a symbol of bonded labor or slavery or labor for that matter in general, where his struggles go unseen and unacknowledged. And so uh, my question is recently in one of the judgments of Supreme Court, there was one judge who said, uh, what he doesn't understand, quote unquote, what this fuss about the migrant situation is. And they're getting three meals a day. They're getting 500 rupees in their Jandhan bank account. Then what is, why, why, uh, why is everybody fussing over it? So doesn't that somehow uh, also reflect on uh, the, the very mindset which makes us think that 
we are above those people we dehumanize them to such an extent that we you know, we think that just giving them 500 bucks or some atta and some dal and some rice is enough for their sustenance does this idea of uh, you know having a balanced diet for that matter doesn't that also uh, comprise the existence of humanity i mean the question of dignity at the end comes to play or no you can go first can i go first yeah okay the point is if you stay hungry for 5 days let, let whoever says it stay hungry for 5 days not because they're going on a fast huh? not because of a religious reason or because of anything but just be hungry because you can't access food then they will know what it means to be hungry the second thing i feel that we don't know is how hard it is and what expertise you need to labor i really think it's far easier to use a pen than to use a scythe or to use the pickaxe hamare yahan to kehte hain ki jo mazdoori karne wale hain unko to kehte hain ki unskilled hain but they are terribly skilled people just as when i was reading sebastian and sons the person who makes the rhythm game is the is the player i mean he ultimately is the player because he decides the tone he decides so many things so how do we now take the mindset of people who live in such divisive and such simplistic categories it has to begin with all of you that's why whenever we have interns in the nkss we make them work at least for half a day i'm sure nipun and anish have done it for half a day on an nrg work site we give them the same amount of work that a very underfed ill nourished mal nourished woman does and we give it to a team of five there and a team of five well fed young indians on the other side and the five young indians who think they are extremely skilled and the ones who think they are unskilled you see that the unskilled ones do the work with casual ease whereas the skilled ones don't know how to, i mean especially what is called a ganti which is a pickaxe with two sharp edges everyone says don't lift it because you might kill someone else or kill yourself you don't even know how to pick up the pickaxe so i would suggest that if you listen to what those children have to say i learned of course every time that what i was thinking was correct so i was reassured every one of them said this is not unskilled work because today the judge and i use a pen and we use a computer we think it is very skilled work but because somebody else does that work and there is more supply than demand for that work i think it's unskilled work so who said it's unskilled i think i've been fighting this battle for the last 40 years saying it's not unskilled work it's skilled work so if a skilled person who uses the pen needs nourishment for the brain needs protein needs a number of things why should that laborer not need it but this argument to be built will also be your job as much as it is ours it has to be every indian's job and the second thing that i do feel very strongly about goes back to some of the things krishna has said already is that if we do not break that untouchability we'll never bring in equality you can have somebody who plays the dhol beautifully in the in the temple but he or she can't enter the temple similarly in south india and in carnatic music there's so much but in northern india it still exists in this the same thing exists to such an extent today krishna as i was reading the book sebastian and sons i realized that many of the drums in rajasthan have become plastic drums they no longer put height yeah. and the tone is so terrible you know can't bear the sharp tone it's it's ugly the tone but then the skin is what contaminates them so i think then is a dilemma are they going to use the skin and be contaminated and stigmatized forever or are they going to use plastic and destroy the music forever you and i are responsible for it they are not so i think there's such layers of discrimination and misunderstandings and sometimes naivete and i think you in the younger generation will have to fight mindsets like 
the Supreme Court judge, myself, yourself, everybody else who carries with us this great in, in unconscious arrogance that we are very privileged people because we have a mind and the others don't have a mind. Everyone has a mind and everyone has skills and everyone doesn't have skills. So that mindset if we bring to bear, then we will work. But for these migrants, we are obliged under the law to provide them food, health security and a passage home. Today, I think the first come of the first trains have started flying the last two, three days. And there's been mayhem because everybody wants to get onto the train to go home. And we have not even subsidized their fare to go back home. People have not been earning for two months, are now starving, and they have to pay that from where will they get the money? So I think to see that level of economic inequality, we just have to go back three centuries and think of a queen who said, if they don't have bread, give them cake. And we know what happened to her and to her regime in France. So soon, if we continue to say this, we know what will happen to us. Now, I just want to say, add one thing uh, to what uh, Adna said, is uh, we can't run away from caste and gender discrimination when people think this way and speak this way. Um, therefore, and I don't want to hide behind that word class. And I think most of the times that is used uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a screen not to actually address the more difficult ones and the fundamental ones that divides our society, which is caste and, uh, and gender. And I, this, I think the statement by the judge makes it amply even more clear that in our judiciary, in our upper judiciary, in our media, we need more people from different sections of society. We need more people from Dalit communities. We need more women. We need more trans people. All of them occupying these seats because that is as important in trying to influence and change this kind of absolutely casteist and discriminatory statements and behavior. If this statement was made in public by anybody else, we, we would not keep quiet. But the fact that now it is being said blatantly, almost like normalizing it from, from the highest, highest court in this country, says something about how, how low we have come in our understanding after so many years of reservation, affirmative action, and discussions and discourse. It again reflects on why there is probably been very little cultural shift among the privileged society in this country. And again, going back to um, our discussion on cultural change and the relevance of art in all this. And I want to say one more thing, is that, um, you know, in Sebastian and Sons, and Aruna spoke about uh, my book, um, you know, there are many people who are upset uh, that I was equating the making of the Mridangam with the playing of the Mridangam. It almost seemed like a problem for them. Uh, first, the book doesn't, I mean, I mean, I don't really do that, but nevertheless, I was, I found it very intriguing that people were disturbed, that I was actually saying that the maker is as great an intellectual as the player. How can a maker whose name I don't even know be equal to the great names of Mridangam playing? How is it even possible? These are these giants, these, these people who represent Indian art and culture. These people are some backdoor operators who put wood and height together, who know to bring tone, who just do it habitually and after a point of time get it right. I mean, that is how many people thought. So the fact that that's how we view uh, people's work, and that's how we view labor is, uh, is, uh, you know, is so disturbing because that is where we place these human beings. That's where we place these communities. And therefore, a lot of what we do is many times done out of pity. Isn't that so, so disturbing that, you know, and that's the worst place any discourse can begin. That's the worst place. And uh, I think these moments and these comments make us also reflect on how we're going to carry forward these discourses and, these and, and take on these challenges. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have got a lot of questions from our viewers on YouTube. And before I, we start taking those questions, I'd like to uh, reflect on one last question, which is about the transgender population. 
so you uh, so you worked very closely with the transgender population uh, especially the jogappa community and i must say one, one of the programs that i uh, attended in delhi in the central park that was one of the most out of the world experiences i have had so far and uh, so when we talk about the marginalized communities the transgenders are what we call in literature double marginalized communities because one their gender and second the uh, the not the choice but the kind of uh, work that is sort of forced upon them through years and generations of conditioning and living in a society uh, society which doesn't look upon them as equals uh, as a matter of fact uh, i have noticed and i've also read about it that uh, transgenders have a very nomadic life and but they are not considered migrant laborers so i'd like aruna ma'am and you both of you to touch upon this topic and talk about the transgender community and their struggles aruna you want to go or shall i go you go first okay so i, I the trans community have you know in fact even in our discourse uh, in uh, you know after the pandemic that's a community that we've not spoken enough about and we've not we not not enough has been written do so they have been some some people who have been working uh, in that sphere they are they been extremely marginalized even in the uh, even in normal days their very existence is uh, is questioned their very existence their very physicality their being their their uh, way of talking their music uh, their occupation many of time many times many of them are sex workers their occupation everything is seen to be a stain on society so actually most of society will be happier if they didn't exist though that's the truth and that's how they are treated now that is the situation on in normal days and you can only imagine how things has, have been further exasperated in the last two months um many of them are also musicians i i know uh, we've been working with a few uh, trans musicians and artists theater people artists uh, poets uh, dancers Uh, all kinds of artists and both in tamil nadu in kerala in karnataka there are many like this all of them have nothing absolutely nothing um, their local performances of course are gone and you know there is this whole notion of pollution that is also something ravana ji uh, touched upon is their very existence is a battle between the idea of pollution and the idea of sanctified many of them are used to sanctify and purify and bless and at the same time their very existence is a polluting existence so this their whole cultural being is so complex and so very 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 uh, um so abused by larger society that during this period it has been only worse and there is support going and there is some help happening but definitely not enough but i want to say one thing that whatever we are seeing today during the pandemic is only a reflection of the fact that during normal days during days when there are no pandemic that there has not been enough work enough action with regards to these issues and during a pandemic everything automatically gets accentuated gets multiplied and compounded and that's what we are seeing today as far as the trans community i mean we were even spoke to some of the jogopas who are in karnataka and all and their 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 art for example is very religious so they have their festivals connected to those festivals there is singing many of them sing during uh, family functions like i said the purification act during family functions then you can imagine the trans people who are sex workers and their situation so in fact many of them saying we have no we have no customers today there are nobody coming to us that is our only way of earning a living what do we do when our existence itself is considered wrong when our profession is considered evil when we are considered we are that we have no rights because of who we are how do we demand rights in a situation like this so i mean while there are many organizations working with them and doing their best these are you know these are also important cultural questions that we have to ask ourselves on how we going to change this mindset how we going to change the way we think about these things 
And uh, unless we do that, uh, the, the condition of the trans people is a situation of being double marginalized, no doubt about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't know, ma'am. Would you like to comment on that? Just a very small comment. Krishna has made a very all, all comprehensive statement. But I just want to say that this community uh, has the worst deal. Rejected by family because as soon as they are born, they are dumped. Rejected by the system of every system in society. They are rejected by all the welfare programs because the first thing you have to declare is whether you're female or male. Only very, very recently, I think, there is a column in which you can say you're transgender. To declare that you're transgender, you're, the most horrendous kinds of things have to be done. You have to be physically examined and you can be awful. I mean, I don't know how much of this is true, but one transgender uh, woman made the statement that they can be physically examined anywhere in a public space. I mean, not totally public, but in a secluded public space to make sure that they're not passing themselves off as transgender. The humiliation of being in that position is extreme. And I don't think any of us understand the tremendous amounts of mental torture that just being a transgender causes people in India. And I agree with Krishna that everything is raised to the power of end with this pandemic. Because for everything you need a number, you need a card, you need a registration. Yeah. And how many of them have it? They don't have permanent addresses. If you're a sex worker, you don't have a permanent address. It's just awful. So I'll leave it at that. And I'll say that it's one of the worst positions to be in today in India. If you're transgender and you are a victim of a structure in which everything has to be proved all the time. We, um, we are getting so many questions. We'll just take two more and uh, then we'll conclude. <coughs> Sanjini, you want to ask something? Uh, hmm. Yeah. So uh, we've got a question from Tiwari ji, who's a very uh, senior volunteer of Spik McKay from Muzaffar Nagar. He's asking, uh, do we need to demystify the uh, classical music? Well, uh, uh, that's a no-brainer for me. There's nothing mystical about it. Let me just break it down. Yo, I mean, I, I'm saying this bluntly and I'm saying it in a way that, that, that bothers people and I'm doing it purposely. Because, uh, I mean, we mystified it to the point of it, uh, it becoming unreal. It becoming not something of part of human activity. That the artisan somehow is either, especially in art forms that we think are mystical. We don't think all art forms are mystical, by the way. Let's be very clear. Huh? We think certain art forms are mystical. And we don't think all art forms are mystical. So those art forms that we think are mystical need to be demolished. The mysticism has to be demolished from right. The ivory tower needs to be broken. Now, what you experience when you receive art is personal and to you. Okay. But art itself is a function of society. It is, uh, uh, of course, it's, a, it's in the case of music, it's a musicological being. It has history. It has social frameworks. It has all the practices that we see within the communities that practice that art. All the, uh, all the beautiful and the ugly things that exist in society will automatically also be in art. Let's remember that. Everything that we see in society, you will also see in art. That's why it is a reflection of society. You can't say art reflects only those very pretty things that I find pretty in society. No, it reflects everything else too. Therefore, as long as the moment we, we speak about art in that very, very temporal, tactile, real sense, then, there, then the whole mysticism aspect we don't need to discuss. How it impacts you, how it makes you feel deep, is something you feel. And I'm not going to question that feeling. And what feeling I have, I, that I have. But its existence is political. The moment we understand also the word political, and we start realizing that art is an act of politics. And I mean this in the most uh, rounded sense. Okay? Then I think we, have, we, don't have, we won't get caught in these jargons. And in these... Uh, you know, the only way we discuss about art is in technical terms. 
you know or in some if you in music you'll say this rag can you do this in that tala can you do this all this we never discuss it about who is listening who is singing who is not singing who is not listening why are only listen to certain things why do i find something beautiful simple question if i ask myself why do i find a art form beautiful it's a very complicated question the moment we start engaging in that with that honesty then it's demystified and i want to tell you one thing if anybody is scared that this kind of very serious uh reflection or investigation will take away the experience that you have it will not don't worry about it it will not that's the magic of the human mind that how much we we know something doesn't change the way we experience it or way way we want to experience i'll give an i'll give you an analogy for this there's something called the megurk effect okay i don't know the exact syllable I, i may be wrong in it but you can see it on youtube so the megurk effect is between what you see my mouth moving moving and what is the sound you associate with that movement so the scientist has proven that you know i say say ta 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 okay now what he does is he puts the same mouth movement but changes the syllable change the syllable that you're listening to and it's how the mind gets tricked by it and this man has investigated this for 20 years every time he sees it he still experiences the same thing so i want to tell you that how much ever you investigate it how much ever you understand it it is not going to change the profound effect it has on you you will in fact have a far more profound effect let me tell you one thing that for me music has been far more revealing when i was on when i was willing to honestly reflect upon its ugliness there's a question uh, thank you thank you sir uh, there's a question by uh, aman saying sir your music is often so transcendental and is often compared to what great kishori tai used to do to her audiences that is for that for that two hours of concert people forgot everything please tell us a bit about it <laughs> i'm not sure how i'm supposed to answer <laughs> that question thank you for that uh, compliment and it's uh, well it's really an honor to be mentioned in the same line as uh, kishori tai um well I, i i just think that anything in life i mean so all the all that aruna does or anybody else everybody all of us do the moment we commit to it and when i say commit i'm talking about committing as a selfless act uh the moment we commit as a selfless act to it then the experience out that we get out of it is so much more true and honest and that's all it is so uh it is our ability to commit and to remain vulnerable and to remain to to try and be unselfish in the way we commit that's all i that's all there's nothing else to it thank you sir uh, okay. hello can you hear me yeah 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 okay um so i saw one second i just um i saw a uh, eye glance at her watch a few minutes ago i think <laughs> think both of you are a time limit but i think just one or two things more and unless you really like have to go then you can tell me right here even if you like don't mind but otherwise just um we'll push for 10 minutes more if that's okay um, what you want to go i but that's okay 10 okay. minutes fine, fine. Okay. yeah 10 minutes fine. fine okay so i um one thing that i remember from the gurukul anubhav uh, experience was that um the songs that we had and especially i remember the rti anthem not the wording but i remember i just looked up again the singer vina and charu and i remember shankar mama's puppetry and of course you have spoken about that um, in some way and form but these are things that i remember because i've been there and um, but these forms of uh, art especially localized these are things and stories that artisans aren't really able to bring out maybe because they don't have the technological privilege that all of us have right now so um while we go towards the conclusion i would request you to maybe bring that back into this conversation as in how going forward in this uh, towards the end of this pandemic when we come out of it hopefully how will their lives change and what can we consciously 
to make that better. Um, I, if you could. Well, uh, you know, actually, one thing that is uh, uh, which uh, we have as people understood is that it's uh, it's the immediate connection with human beings, and that rules out this kind of technology and re really rules out mass communication. It it really is a, a communication between a set of human beings, and at that level local folk systems are fantastic mm. because they change. Actually, you take Kabir. Look at the way Kabir is sung. For instance, Kabir is a very popular amongst the working class, very popular amongst Dalits, very popular amongst women. You know, we all sing Kabir in Rajasthan, <laughs> but every one of them gives another interpretation. The same words, maybe even the words are pronounced differently. The couplets are are not in the same sequence, they are they are in a different sequence and we sing differently. Now, the one thing that I, it struck, actually, I'm going to quote my friend Sushila again. Something Sushila said to me about a week or 10 days ago about this COVID was the only optimistic thing I've ever heard said. And she said that because of COVID, maybe we'll all look at village self-reliance, and maybe we'll remember Gandhi in a positive sense. Maybe we'll now understand that we have to go back environmentally to nature. Maybe we'll understand we'll have to all go back to making our own food and our own culture. And in a sense, it may even take us, if we all push it the right way, maybe it'll take us to, to a point where we will generate everything. So the puppet, the puppet that Shankar uses is really not an Indian puppet. It's a puppet. The Indian puppet is a string puppet. And the string puppet needs extraordinary skill. So what it is, is a non-Rajasthani glove puppet. But in Shankar's hands, and in the hands of Ram Lal, or in the hands of any one of us, it becomes a totally Rajasthani puppet because it speaks Rajasthani, it feels Rajasthani, it, you know, it thinks Rajasthani. So it becomes a Rajasthani puppet. So much so that you and I have forgotten that it's Genesis. It's born somewhere miles and miles away. And the Rajasthani string puppet is no longer in front of us. So what Sushita has quoted this woman, and I think it's a beautiful quote and I think I'll end there because we've gone on talking too much. But what, culturally speaking, look at the way we express ourselves. Look at my verbosity. Look at the number of words I pack in. Itne shabdon ka, main itna ginti hu, itne, itna bolti hu, hum kehte chakki pisne. She said to Sushila, Are Benji, Mera Lugri, Pat Jata hai to me usko dagi se po satium, Mera pet patega, Sakya ilaje. And she was talking about Tanga. Now, this is the kind of poetry that emerges out of local. Idiom, it's wonderful. Where Mohanji said, Pele wale chor to banduk se marta tha. Aajkal ka chor to kalam se marta hai raad choru. <laughs> the lyrics, yeah. they are lyrics of the highest order. Because they reach and they pierce through every person's heart to the core of that person's being. So politics without culture will not hold. Movements without culture will not hold. And actually folk methods which are so direct are the means by which you can communicate quickly and well, rather than an advertisement jingle or uh, or a jingle for selling a fair is lovely. I would much rather sing Mohanji's lyrics and Sushila's pity sayings because they they have a far greater and more important politics than the politics of fair is lovely. Fair is lovely is also politics, but that's a commercial politics. I'd like to talk democratic politics and rights politics through music. Um, I will just try to get one more in for you. Nipun has the question. Okay. Uh, thank you for your answer. So there's one question by Dhananda Kanta Mishra. He, uh, so the question is, what is the next stage in the evolution of democracy? And what is your opinion on uh, citizen assembly? How do we look forward? I think I'd talk about the citizen assembly first, that we have to now 
look at citizen assembly very very seriously because if i go out now and move out of my home and go into the street i'm going to face arrest or being pushed back if i go into a conglomerate and i critique the government i'll be labeled anti state i'll be labeled a terrorist or a whatever there are million ways of putting me behind bars and now there is additional ammunition as if there wasn't ammunition before now we have more acts it will put me in jail for saying nothing so which has happened just recently as well so we know that if you if i am called an activist or people think of me as uh, an urban nakshal that's it finished i don't have then you don't have to listen to what i'm saying you don't have to hear you just have to make this mental picture of me and then i'm in jail so where is your citizen assembly is citizen assembly only allowed if you praise the system or is it going to be allowed if you critique the system is going to be a important question you and i have to deal with and when there is no dissent when there is no disagreement and there is no questioning there is no scientific inquiry there is no reason there is no rationality and to my good friends who all think growth is the answer to everything there is no growth growth is constant questioning and innovation that leads to growth otherwise this that you are static about the evolution of democracy you and i are going to shape it together i can't give you a mantra it will be a mantra we jointly evolve and you young people will have to evolve it much more actively than i do but please remember that whatever might be said the indian constitution still is the dream of a new india it was the future of a new india it was an india which the, the with all its complexities its contradictions its uh, its superstitions and its uh, vulnerabilities and its strengths that extraordinary minds put together as a common minimum program for a good and decent democracy to exist for our country so let's go back to the constitution and let's really make it work for us as a beginning and we get a really evolved democracy waiting for us but if we do that and we fight for it because now we'll have to fight for it thank you ma'am uh, so would you like to comment on that no i, th I think she's covered it all uh, uh so before we request you to sing Please. a little bit for us <laughs> i'd like to conclude with your and ma'am's permission by quoting a few lines from tagore of course uh, please do so uh, as we spoke to both of you and as it came out uh, very evidently through this session that the extravaganzas in human history they are not permanent they are not things that will go down into history and will be remembered but uh, the real excellence of human beings is shaped by the silent and hard toil of the common people the marginalized sections the workers the be it the guest workers or workers in general so uh, at the very end of his life a few months before his demise tagore wrote this poem ora kaj kore and i'd like to just quote the last few lines english translation of that for so that everybody can understand they toil far and wide at the river and the sea side of assam bengal orissa punjab bombay and gujarat at civilizations hub day and night rumble and hum all over animate the earth with fervor to work up life's supreme heim they toil aside hundreds of empires ruin thank you thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you uh, so could we request uh, what, what do i think mm -hmm. um just one second before you make up your mind uh, dr seet uh, had messaged me during the session dr timmy seet a founder and he requested me to convey his best wishes to both of you so i will just to convey that and thank uh, you hmm 
Oh, I am truly blank. I can't think of anything to sing right now. Oh. If you need a minute more, give I me a second. Talk. Yeah, all formalities by then. This is quite, uh, I don't know, opportune, inopportune, but um, thank you, Shinjini, Nipun, Abhishek Bhaiya, and Backstage for facilitating all of this. I for allowing us to push your time so much. And um, if I can't see uh, Krishnaji back in the frame, I'll just announce uh, the sessions that we have coming up next. Um, we have Pandit uh, Ronu Majumdar. Uh, I'm not reading out the dates. It's all there somewhere in social media. Uh, Shrimati Minal Pandey. Uh, Pandey. Suresh Tavalkar, uh, Srimati Rohini Tangare, uh, Pandit Pudhas Kashalkar, Sri Kailash Satyarthi, and uh, Sri Venkat Raman Singh Shyam. Uh, all of these artists are scheduled to join us live uh, in the coming day. And all this information is there on Twitter, Facebook, and all of those places. With Sri Prerna Shimali Ji and uh, Sushri Shetha Joshi Ji, uh, uh, teacher and student. So, yeah, I don't think I missed any. Yeah. So, thank you, and now. I'm just going to sing uh, four lines. That's about it. Mm. Oh, the needed stuff is all around the place. Give me a second. I am all out of fillers. In case <laughs> one or Shinjini or I have anything. We are having a blank uh, silent space before his song. Which is as it should be. Yes. <laughs> um. I don't know. I think you can join me for this one. You know this song. Yes. I, don't know. I know you know it. Let's see. I'm going to sing only the first four lines. Mm. Abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. Aruna, waiting for you. I'm singing. I'm singing. Abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, who abide with me. Help of the helpless who abide with me. Help of the helpless who abide with me. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the time. Thank you all very much. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Namaste. Bye. Salam. <laughs> Satri Akal. Hello, everything. And <laughs> bye. See you. There's one song we sing when we say goodbye. Of course, uh, it's not really a song, but we sing Ram Salam. I don't know if you know that. MKS is always end with Mara Ram Salam Le Li Jo Re Ji Wala To Phir Milala. Nika Rijore. So it's Ram <laughs> Salam. Ram you Salam it is. We made it Ram, Ram Salam. Salam. <laughs> so live well. Nika, stay well. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.